Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. I'll be reading from the second chapter. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from scriptures, passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What, they exclaimed, it takes, has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning we have this passage, this angry Jesus passage, where Jesus cleared the temple, cleansed the temple from all of its corruption. During this time when Jesus was alive, when he was incarnate as a human, Jerusalem was the center for all things religion, all things political, and it was expected that the Messiah would show up at this location. This passage tells us that that Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem because it was the beginning, almost time, for the Passover celebration. And this celebration was occurred every year. It's a longstanding tradition that commemorates the freeing of the Israelites from slavery from Egypt. And we can read about that, of course, in our Bible in the second book of Exodus. But the Passover lasted one night, and that would begin a week-long celebration, the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And since this was one of the three high holy days, one of the three Jewish festivals, it was expected that every single Jewish male would make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to this temple, for this very important week. And just like our our churches tend to get more full on our holy days of Christmas and Easter, the temple was certainly uh, at capacity and it would become crowded for this festival. We have all of these visitors, all of these foreign travelers, those making this annual pilgrimage, not just from the immediate area, but all throughout Judea, those traveling from afar, converging on this one site for this very holy celebration. I mean, we could think about that as all of Berks County converging here to to Westlawn, to our campus. A lot of people in one space, uh, pre-COVID, right? (laughs) A lot of people converging makes an ideal opportunity to make some money. The merchants, the, the local businessmen, the, the shopkeepers saw this as an opportunity to put themselves in the, in the black for the, the proverbial black to, to, to uh, strengthen their, their wallets. And as we read, the temple authorities, the priests also took this as an opportunity to, to strengthen their treasury as well. And they accomplished this by allowing the, the money changers to, to literally set up shop on their campus, not a few blocks away or, or not even across the street, but, but literally set up their, their tables and their tents and their shops right on the holy place near and on the temple. And they, the, the priests, they rationalized this because the practice, it benefited them, right? They, they were able to make money. They were able to help pay the bills and to put them financially in the black as well. Conveniently, conveniently, the temple tax had to be paid and it had to be paid in the local currency. We could think of that as if Berks County had its own money, we would have to pay the temple tax, so to speak, in Berks County money. That was the only thing that would be accepted. Thus, the need for the money changers to convert their out-of-town currency into the locally acceptable money. Unfortunately, shady behavior occurred for the money changers. They took advantage of the out-of-town travelers and they charged outrageously high exchange rates. But what were they gonna do about it? What were all these out-of-towners going to do about it? You were there, you needed it, they had it, you had to pay the tax, 
So you did what you had to do according to their standards. You didn't like it. You knew that they were taking advantage of you. You knew what was happening, but you did it. In that same bit of shadiness that went on with the currency exchange also went on with the livestock. Livestock was necessary, the cattle, the sheep, the doves, depending on what you could afford, how affluent you were, depended on, on what kind of sacrifice you bought and offered at the temple for the sacrifice. And as we said, people were, were traveling from afar. There were no trains and, and, and cars to, to transport animals there quite easily. And so because of the, the long trip, the overwhelming majority of people did not bring an animal for sacrifice. They would decide to buy one when they got to the temple. Some people actually did bring an animal. And ironically, ironically, when they did bring their own animal, the temple inspectors would say, oh, this animal has an imperfection <laughs> and it's not good enough to be killed for, for your sacrifice. But conveniently over here, let me introduce you to our own sheep and, and cattle. And, you know, thank God that, that we have our own here for sale. And you can see how, how this is going because these animals were perfect while the ones that you brought were imperfect. So it was kind of a, a corrupt system. And I say kind of, <laughs> you could just strike that from, from the sentence. It was a very corrupt system business that was going on. It was a racket. This reminds me of a time when I was 10 years old and I was traveling to Canada with my grandfather for a fishing trip. My grandfather's very wise and a bit frugal. Um, so a day or two before we packed the truck with our fishing gear, we decided to go over into the fields of the farmers and flip over dried cow manure because they harden like Frisbees and you can actually throw them. Yes, I have thrown cow manure Frisbees. Has anyone else ever done that? Come on. All right, I guess I'm the only one. But if you flip them over and you dig around a little bit underneath, there are earthworms, the big fat good ones that are good for fishing, better than the ones that you could buy in the store. And we gathered dozens and dozens of these worms to, to take from Pennsylvania up into Canada for our fishing trip. And apparently here was, uh, I say he was probably about 55 then and a 10 year old boy crossing the, the American into, into Canada, the border. And apparently we looked shady because we got flagged by the Canadian border patrol to, to pull over to the side and to have our vehicle searched for contraband. And the only contraband that they found that we had any others were these earthworms. The earthworms were considered contraband, illegal. And we were informed that it was illegal to, to transport these earthworms over international borders because uh, of transmitting disease. It was agriculture, so you couldn't take earthworms and you couldn't take the dirt. So what the Border Patrol's agent remedy was for the situation was for me to take this big Folgers coffee can stacked with worms uh, and dirt to literally walk back across the bridge, across the river, to go halfway back across the bridge uh, over the river to the placard that showed the line where uh, Canada and America were, were uh, divided and to dump the, the worms and the, and the dirt into the water, of course, on the American side, because otherwise it would have been a crime. So yeah, so uh, that was me uh, uh, evading Interpol, dumping out the worms in, in the American side. It was quite, we still tell the story around the picnic table with my grandfather. He still gets quite irritated and agitated 25 years later because we put in a lot of hard work to flip over those cow floppers, as he called them, <laughs> looking for the, I cannot believe no one else here has ever done that. We are gonna do that as soon as the weather gets nice. <laughs> to which then, because we had to dump out our worms, we had to go then to a local bait shop to buy these subpar worms, as my grandfather would say. They're junk, they're no good. And no, we didn't think the Canadian Border Patrol is in cahoots with the local bait shops. But the frustration that we felt may, ha may have been similar to those at the temple who had uh, taken the time to bring their own animals only to be told they're not good enough, but we have something better to offer you. And a few of you have told me that you can't wait until this pandemic starts to come out on the other side and, and local stadiums uh, begin to open up. And as we approach spring, of course, it's, it's baseball season. And a few of you have said you can't wait just to go to the ballpark and to have a beer and a hot dog. Well, while the minor league systems are a little cheaper than, say, Philadelphia or New York, but if we go to a baseball game, we're paying at least 15 bucks for a beer and a hot dog, right? <laughs> because they have it and you want it and you're there for two or three hours or four hours. And while you are there, they can charge whatever they want because more often than not, many of us are going to pay 
that price. And the same went on, exactly that same feeling that we get with the temple. The difference is we have cars. We can hop in our, our Honda or, or, or a Cavalier and, and drive home and get dinner and, or search for cheaper alternatives. But when these folks were in Jerusalem at the temple, they had no other choice. So they were being gouged. They were being taken. They were being exploited because they were there and they knew what they had to offer. And that's exactly what Jesus was upset about. You see, this place that was supposed to be used for worship, this place that was intended for a place to revere God, to give thanks to God, to offer sacrifices to God was being turned into a marketplace, a flea market, if you will. And Jesus saw all these unscrupulous practices, the the greed, uh, the desiring of money to exploit those that were there was making a mockery out of the temple. The religious leaders, they knew what they were doing or they had simply forgotten about it, but instead they put their own selfish pursuits, their desires, the, the, the craving of money ahead of their own and they had become corrupted, which then in turn led Jesus to that righteous anger that he displayed in the scripture that we read about. And he didn't take lightly. Jesus did not take lightly to what was going on, what had become of the temple. He, he flips the tables and, and scatters the coins. He, he makes a cord and, and he whips out, uh, he, he scatters the, the animals to, to leave the temple. He made a scene. He, he disrupted the entire marketplace and said, enough. This is not how it is supposed to be. Get out. This is not what my father's house is intended to be. Of course, he met resistance. The, the religious leaders, the priests approached him and said, who, is it, you know, who do you think you are? Who does this guy think he is disrupting our system, the, the system that we have in place? And now he's, he's telling us that the temple is going to be destroyed and he'll build it back up in three days. You see, the temple was built in Jerusalem at the top of a hill overlooking all of the city. And it was first built by King Solomon some thousand years before Jesus is flipping tables. So a thousand years before the temple was built, it was ultimately destroyed by the Babylonians when they invaded Israel and they held them captive and enslaved them. And then again, it was rebuilt about 500 years later. And now during this time, when Herod the Great was ruling over Jerusalem and parts of Israel, He actually was in the process of remodeling the temple and making it larger. And that took 46 years. That's what the priests were alluding to. But what Jesus is saying is to all those that were there and making this mockery out of the temple, he says, you don't get it. Jesus wasn't talking about the physical structure of the building, but he was instead symbolically acting out God's judgment upon the temple, the corruption the, the selfish desires, the pursuit of money, the greed, the merchants that were exploiting others, the temple priests that were well-to-do that used their, their faith to elevate their status amongst those that were gathered to, to fatten their wallets and to appease the Romans. Even the temple itself had literally become desecrated because as Herod did in fact uh, enlarge the temple and uh, remodel it, so to speak, to make it look better, his allegiance, his loyalty, Herod's, was not to God. It was instead to Rome because at the front of the temple gates was a a giant eagle statue, which was the Roman symbol for power. So even at the most holy of holy places, according to the Israelites, the temple was desecrated with this Roman power of symbol for the, the empire. During this season of Lent, especially we ask ourselves, or we sometimes ask the pastor, why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? And shameless plug, Monday nights at seven o'clock on Zoom, I'm leading a Bible study that sort of asks, answers that exact question. We're two weeks in, you got four more weeks left, never too late to join. But why did Jesus die? Why, what did Jesus accomplish on the cross for us? We wonder that, we ponder that, and it's, it's not an easy answer. But what if we also ask why not, I mean, excuse me, we do ask why did Jesus die and we we usually respond theologically, right? But a different question that we could ask is why did they kill Jesus? Why did they kill Jesus? And that's a different question. It's a different answer. 
We can look no further to this passage that we're looking at this morning for Jesus's disruption of the temple, for shutting down these operations, the commerce in the temple. I mean, he forecast its own destruction. And according to the priests, he was definitely speaking heresy. As far as the Romans were concerned, the, the oppressors, Jesus was upending the system and creating all this friction. The focal point of their faith, Jesus is saying to them and is saying to us is, it's no good. Look of how you become corrupted. Look at what the temple has become desecrated with your sinful behavior. Jesus was upsetting the establishment and all that it represented. And that's why they wanted to kill him. The religious elite, the pomp and circumstance of their faith, the sacrifices, the, the changing of the money, following the letter of the law, life being governed by rules and yet still never feeling like you're good enough. Those that are supposed to be faithful, those that are supposed to be leading others in their faith and guiding them, Jesus is saying, it's all a sham. Enough, get out. So what does that mean for us here today? It's a great history lesson, right? We, we know a little bit more about the context, but what does that, that mean for our lives? I'd encourage us to think for a moment about ourselves in that situation. We could imagine ourselves as being the temple. We're created in the image of God, uh, created to be in that relationship with him. We're created to, to be a place, a person to, to revere God and, and to lift him up. And yet in our hearts, much like the temple has become corrupted, we ourselves have been corrupted with our sin. We have allowed that sin to creep into our hearts and, and gone astray from where God intends us to be. We may be sitting here this morning or, or tuning in online and we know where our hearts are. God especially knows where our hearts are. We might be blind to it. Others may see it, but we may not fully understand believing that we are on the right path or that we've gotten it all figured out. That because we go to worship on a Sunday for an hour, that we're good to go. Things are all right. And yet, at our own symbolic gates, there's that large golden eagle that reveals our true allegiance. That allegiance that isn't to God or, or first and foremost, but allegiance to something or, or to, to someone else instead of God Almighty. Just just as Jesus cleansed the temple and he didn't take that corruption lightly, Jesus also does not take the sin in our lives lightly. You see, Jesus loves us that much that he knows that we are sinners in need of a savior, that we need to have our hearts cleansed just as Jesus cleansed that temple. Jesus loves us that much that his righteous anger, as much as, as flipping the coin tables, he wants to flip those tables in our hearts because he loves us passionately just the same. And he wants us to have a good standing relationship with him, with God Almighty, God himself, and ultimately to others. The good news is though, that while God's judgment is very real, God's grace is real as well. God offers that free gift of grace. You see, we have a choice. We can continue to allow the temple to be corrupted or we can choose Jesus Christ to cleanse it. Which will it be? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we stand before you today, sinners in need of a savior. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who, who came to us and showed us how to live and to love, but also reminds us for his righteous anger that he hates sin, that he hates how, how we've become corrupted, how we allow the sin to overtake our hearts. God, we humbly confess to you that we have not always loved God. We have not always loved others as you call us to love. But we thank you for your forgiveness. God, hear our, our silent prayers now as we confess our personal sins to you.
The good news is that while we were yet sinners, God sent his one and only son to us to be our Lord and Savior. While we were yet sinners, he offered us that way for reconciliation and forgiveness. To all this we can say, thanks be to God, amen. Friends, as a part of being reconciled to God, he offered us holy communion, this, this means of grace in which we can share in the table all those across time and space. We are welcome and invited to join Jesus in this. We give thanks to God for all that he has done for us, for sending his son to us to offer us that gift of reconciliation. And to that, we just wanna say thank you, God. Thank you for all that you've given to us and that opportunity to, to cleanse our hearts. We ask God that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that are gathered here, for those that are gathered at home on the gifts of the bread and the juice and, and for those elements that you have at home before you, that you make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That through this, we receive that, that moment, that, that gift of, of reconciliation, of grace that brings us back into relationship, that this be used as nourishment for us. Because on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take this and eat this and do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he lifted the cup and said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. This is the new covenant God, we just give you thanks for offering your body and your blood for us. Friends, in the United Methodist Church, all are welcome to receive communion. You don't have to be a member of this church or any other church. You merely just want to live a life according to Jesus. All are welcome to receive this, this sacrament of grace. So at this time, I encourage you, if you want to use uh, the elements in the cup, you may open the bread and take and eat. That is the body of Christ. And you may also open the juice, that is the blood of Christ. Michael, Michael's gonna come up and assist in providing communion for those that desire by intinction. If you can come up as you feel called, you can come up here to the left and make your way across in front of us. of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Trisha. Andy, the body of Christ broken for you. Connie, the body of Christ broken for you. Frank, the body of Christ broken for you. Dennis, the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, my friend. of Christ broken for you. Zach, the body of Christ broken for you. And the body of Christ broken for you. Caleb, the body of Christ broken for you. Tom, the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. And the body of Christ broken for you. You weren't digging today though, right? <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this gift of this holy mystery that you offer to us through communion. May it sustain us, may it guide us, may it lead us to, to cleanse our hearts and to follow you. All this we give thanks in Jesus Christ, our, our Lord and our Savior, and all his children said, amen. Amen.